Hey guys, my name is Matt, and uh, this is Doug. And uh, I wanted to make a video about uh, the uh, Majos. Um, not as many people know about them as I think should, and um, they've really been a game-changing uh, telemark binding for me. Um, it was my first video, and uh, I really appreciate all the guys who've made videos and women who have made Telemark videos and been posting content on YouTube because um, it's kind of a scattered sport and um, it's hard to get information about um, about it. You know, like a lot of ski stores only have you know a few Telemark bindings, um, and not many people at the shop will necessarily um, Telemark. So you know, they, they it's just not it's not a very centralized knowledge base, and it's great that we have. Um, people making videos. A um, little bit about me, why I started Telemark skiing was um, I grew up in upstate New York and um, hey Doug, would you please dig over there? Thank you. Um, anyway, I grew up in upstate New York and um, we grew up, you know, in the winter doing the 46ers. We'd stay at the lodge and um, take Mount Marcy um, with uh, family and family friends. You know, every Christmas it was a tradition. And um, we, you know, we'd snowshoe, and then, and at that time, it was cross-country skiing, telemark. It was all kind of still, you know, it's all still evolving. It's still evolving now, but um, you know, there was like cross-country skis with metal edges, but they didn't have springs. And then, you know, you're starting to see guys with springs, and there's a small group of uh, telemark skiers. Um, this guy Ron Conowitz and his friends were like kind of leading this pack of backcountry uh, tele skiers and they you know we, they'd come through the trees riding the single track and I remember I was just like man I want to be be like that someday they used to have the the bells you know so we could hear them because they just come whipping through and we'd be just snowshoeing up or using our cross-country skis which have like no control that was basically like sledding um, anyway so I wanted to be like that and um, when I went to college my parents got me telemark skis they were uh, K2 World Peace with G3 wires um, and some T2s. That's what the guy at the store recommended. You know, I went in and he's like, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to do backcountry? you want to do resort? And I'm like, I don't know. I want to do it all. And so, you know, that's what we started out with. And it was a, it was a pretty good setup. But, um, you know, I started really charging at the resort. And, you know, I was breaking wires a lot. And um, I would get my shins would hurt because the boots weren't high enough. And I was like, okay, it's, I, I'm looking for the next thing. So that's when I discovered the Bomber Bishops. And the Bishops were a great binding. They were super durable, but they did not release. And um, super powerful. But uh, unfortunately, um, I broke my fibulas skiing through the trees. Um, and uh, that really made me... Um, want to look for a releasable binding. So there wasn't much at the time. I wish I had known about the Boley hardwire releasable binding, but I didn't know about that. So I ended up in uh, 17 power tours and those bindings I really don't like. They, um, they're not very powerful um, and they pre-release all the time and they're just not, uh, you know, they were just a step in the direction, but um, don't need to hate on them, but they, they were not for me. So then, um, about that time, that's when NTN really started coming about 2010, and, and I was an early adopter of NTN, and it was a game changer for me. I loved it. It made, um, you know, you could just charge so hard at the resort, and I, I released it, released when it was supposed to, and probably saved me a bunch of times. So then, um, that was great, but then they really were not very good at touring, and so I, I started to identify as a slack country telemark skier because I'm like, well, I don't really like hiking that much, even though my whole life I've liked hiking, but the gear was so heavy, it didn't have full range of motion. Um, it just, you know, NTN free rides are just not a good touring binding. If all you want to do is charge a resort, though, I still think they're a, they're a, they're a good, good viable binding. Anyway, so then um, I just kept skiing those for a while, and I started to move away from that country skiing and more towards like off off resort skiing or you know basically I'm utilizing my biking and um, and so that was good for a while and that's kind of where I was at and then um, I remember in 2019 I saw this guy uh, with uh, the 22 Designs links and I was like what is that because I knew he was from his boots that he was on NTN but I'd never seen the two pin you know touring 
So then I started to investigate it, and that's where I went to these videos. And, you know, thanks to Dosti, you know, he, I love listening to this dude ramble about stuff. He's he's definitely a weirdo, as am I, as am all telemark skiers. Same thing with Remy Martin. That guy's awesome. And uh, the guys in Utah that are in Free Hill Life, you know, they're producing a lot of content that's modern. Um, and so thank you for them. Uh, but anyway, so I started researching it and I found the Majo. And the reason why I went to the Majo is because when I looked at the 22 Designs second heel, which is right here, um, the way the second heel functions, it, I don't understand how it releases. So my assumption is, is it doesn't release because uh, that is a point of weakness for the Majo in that that can have icing. So they probably used the Majo, Majo and were like, how can we make this better? But um, they're relying on the tech toe to release. And I, I don't know. I, for me, I just, I would rather fiddle with some icing in my second heel. It's really easy to clear. I'm gonna go over that in a second. But um, the releasability was what drew me to, to the Majo. And so I, I bought them and you know, I went on the resort on them and I was like, wow, these are really cool. And then I was like, I gotta see how they tore because I never toured on two pin um, bindings before. And oh my God, I told, I was like, this is why, I mean, it was why I was getting smoked on the skin track for years and years and years. And I'm going to argue that maybe now that this is, we've got two pin Telemark bindings, that Telemark may have come full circle um, back to being a, a really relevant backcountry skiing tool. Because, you know, for a long time, um, when I was trying to tour with my AT skiing friends, I just, um, I could not hang. I, I would... Um, and it's because, you know, I was on free rides, of course, now that I know that. But if you haven't experienced two pin telemarks, you know, it, it choose, you know, both are great companies. So, um, so yeah, I chose the Majos and I wanted to make this video explaining why I chose the Majos, but I also wanted to spread some knowledge about the Majos so that if you buy the Majos, that if you run into some issues with them, that you are aware of that because it's in the, it's 3.1, I think. So it's 3.0. So, I mean, geez, just look at like windows and like all the iterations of windows. I mean, it's still relatively young technology. I think le less than 10 years for sure, but you know, the more people that buy it and the more people that use it, and the more people that break it and then report their 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 problems to the company, the every year it's going to get better and better. And I think at 3.0, it's definitely something I would recommend right now. Um, and I don't know that some of these things are ever going to be, you know, able to be fixed. But so the first the first issue that I've run into with the Majo is um, if you look right here, um, is you've got what they call the second heel. And there's these red wings and they're spring loaded and that's kind of how you control your dip. And so what will happen is you can see it kind of starting to happen now is you'll get snow up in there. And that snow, depending on the conditions, can freeze and turn to ice or just get really packed up in there. And then what happens is, is that the, the boot will not fully latch into the second heel and you'll be kind of stuck in this purgatory place where you're like not in tour mode and not in downhill mode. And when that first happened to me, I was like, what is going on? And of course, you know, it's a powder day or you're at the resort or you just want to go. You're like, this is really obnoxious. But, you know, once you know how to fix it, all I do most of the time is just take my ski pole and poke it out. I don't know if that's the best recommended option for that because, um, you know, it's metal on plastic. But, you know, they, if you carry a scraper, and I highly recommend carrying a scraper in the backcountry, um, if you ever have dealt with icing and all the head shenanigans, uh, you know, a scraper and uh, glide wax can be a lifesaver. Um, but that's for another video. Um, point being is you just clear that out and then it, it, the problem goes away. Um, not a problem. And then if that's bothering you, if you live in a place where maybe that happens a lot or, you know, it's just a good practice once, once a year or whatever. Well, not once a year, but like, you know, it, it depends on what you ski. But at any rate, bring your skis in, dry them out, and then just soak them in silicone um, spray. You know, you can get it at the hardware store. Basically, it, it just creates like a hydrophobic layer that, that will inhibit that. It doesn't last forever, but it'll last for a little while and it'll help you out. The next one is um, the, two, the, the two pin, the tech toe. So you'll get um, snow that will also get behind the springs in, the, in, the, in here, and then it'll form ice. And then when you go to close the, the, the tech toe, it won't close all the way and that will cause you to prematurely release. That happens a lot less frequently than this, but it does happen and you should be aware of it. Um, all you do there is just take your scraper or your ski pole and you poke the ice out and then it goes away and you're back to skiing. 
Um, so those are the two kind of issues I've had in the field. I've also had these like very little pins. Um, I might try to edit in a, a shot of them, but there's these little pins where where this plastic piece comes in and they've actually worked their way out on a set of that I've had. But um, I went into the shop. Um, I go to Confluence in Denver. Um, John and Brian, they're awesome. Brian's like their head tech. He really knows Major as well. There's not that many stores that sell them. So um, it's important you get a good one. Um, and I can definitely vouch for those guys. But he, you know, was really kind and he had, uh, he's got lots of spare parts and he really replaced that. And I believe Majos have a five year warranty, which is pretty cool. So, you know, it was free of charge, um, which was, which was nice. And I'm sure if you bought the bindings there that they would, that they would accommodate, um, you know, small repairs very, you know, easily at any rate. Um, so yeah, those are the three things. Um, finally, one thing I did have happen, and this is what I recommend when you buy these bindings is, you know, when you're first figuring out your spring tension setting, which is the way you control that is like by spinning these little dials. Somehow I've had one of them just like work its way off. And so I think what happened there is just from vibrations or I don't know it, it, and then the spring and the whole little thing just disappears because when it happened, I thought it was icing and sometimes I'm just, you know, I'm trying to keep up with people that don't always pay attention and basically the spring popped off and I didn't notice it. So I lost that part. And, um, so Brian recommended this particular type of Loctite. He said, don't get just regular Loctite. He, he mentioned that there's a specific type of Loctite that he recommends because if you use regular Loctite that it can um, corrode plastic. And so he didn't recommend using it around the major. So he sells the particular Loctite that is supposed to go with this. Um, Confluence sells that. So just ask them about it. Um, so yeah, and then I mounted these on, um, you know, I, I'm a long time K2 skier. I really like K2. Um, they're a good, you know, value. I think they make great skis and at a reasonable price. Um, you know, and, um, so they, there's, I mounted them on the K2 Wayback, which is a touring ski, um, the 106. And I also have the 96 and 96 is going to be a little better for like firmer snow and spring conditions. The 106 is kind of your like Colorado pow hunter. It's really awesome. Um, Doug is digging again. It's really awesome. Uh, it's super light. I mean, my setup, I dropped like pounds off my setup and I just, I just really have grown to love touring again. I've been touring about, um, you know, six miles to 2000 feet, 1800 feet every other day lately. I've been fortunate to be able to do that this season. The snow has been great here out in Colorado. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, before I close, uh, definitely if you're looking for a, for a great ski, this is a great pairing. Um, K2, this is, you know, there's just a good, I love it. It's got great, uh, rocker. It skis short, you know, but it still floats. So I mean, this is only a 172. I'm five, seven and, um, you know, about 180 pounds, usually up or down. I'm trying to lose weight lately, but I've been doing that actually. At any rate, um, you know, I don't think that I need a longer ski. Of course I can never have enough skis. I'd like to try the 179 just to see, but you know, for really like snapping around on the single track, um, for the 96s, I went with the 177 and I find that ski a little difficult to, to just manhandle because, you know, when you're backcountry skiing, I think, I think a lot of people, when they think about backcountry skiing, think about ski mountaineering and that's great. Ski mountaineering is awesome. But the uh, majority of, the uh, backcountry skiing I'm doing on the daily in Colorado, especially in, you know, January, early season and, you know, midwinter is going to be, you know, tree skiing, um, with my dog, Doug, because he loves it. Um, Doug loves to ski. Um, and so, you know, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily looking for a big mountain ski. You're looking for a ski that, you know, if you're in the trees, you can just snap it around, um, you know, and make quick turns. Because if you don't make a quick turn, you might hit a tree. So um, I I can't say enough about this. I, I know Dosti likes the vocal BMT, and that's also a ski I considered buying and i think that's also another really great option i like dosti's videos i think a lot of what he has to say is really good um some of what he has to say is a little weird like um the idea of not having a, a ski mode and a walk mode like removing that i could not live with that but you know everybody's different so it's important if we make these videos and we share information we can listen to each other and then that's how the evolution of the sport grows um 
things I'd like to ski, see. I mean, first off, I want to thank um, Scarpa and Rodafella for, for pushing NTN forward, for pioneering it. Uh, those companies, are, I mean, that's just awesome. It was because of Rodafella and Scarpa's work that we now have this. I mean, that's how great things work. The boots evolved to a binding that, you know, is probably obsolete now. And but because of that, telework has come full circle and become a viable backcountry tool. And I think the reason why we might even have an advantage over the AT skiers is because of the bellows. So if you look at our stride, you know now with the two pin, we can, we have a, a a wider range of motion um, than the AT skiers. Um, I don't know what's been going on lately. Maybe I'm just getting in better shape, but I've been smoking people on the skin track. Um, and I'm pretty sure, I mean, you know, being in shape is part of it, but I, I'm pretty sure that it's a direct result of this setup. Um, these are the original, well, I don't think they're the original, but they're one of the early models, the, um, the TX, uh, TX Pros. And I really like these, they're really soft. Um, and they're, they're old, and I, I've broken the walk mode on them several times. Um, and so I'm hoping that I can still continue to get replacement walk, walk parts, because when I finally break these, I don't know if I'll be able to replace them, but I just, I just love these. So if you see these on the, you know, on the Facebook marketplace or something or, or the orange ones, buy them up. Um, I also have the uh, blue and orange ones and, uh, they did some updates on those and those are also really good. The reason why I'm not in them today is because the wire broke and I'm fixing that. So, um, it's good to have multiple pairs of boots. Um, but yeah, thank you to Scarpa, uh, for doing that. Doug, you gotta move on talking to people, dude. And um, yeah, thanks to K2 and um, Confluence Sports, you know, Confluence Kayak and Ski in Denver, it's a great shop. Um, thanks to Black Diamond, um, you know, BCA, um, trying to think of companies that over the years have been really kind to me. Um, thank you for all that. And thank you for pushing the sport forward. Thanks for doing that. Um, and finally, I just wanted to close on a little bit of a gripe, um, not to be negative, but I don't understand why when I'm at the resort, there's this propensity of like old dudes that want to come up to me and talk about telemarking and talk about leather boots and stuff. And some of them are like in like, you know, they're telemarking currently and they're in like plastic boots and they're like talking about how they started telemarking back in the day and yada yada. But then I'll kind of catch this vibe like because I'm in NTN or newer equipment that I'm not, uh, I'm not like dropping my knee. And, and, uh, it's kind of irritating because I'm trying to spread generally, you know, one of the reasons why I made this video is to spread this knowledge to people who want it. But when I try to tell people how good this is, you know, it's some people really do listen and, you know, there's, there's the general public has, has all types, but, um, a high, uh, just a high percentage of people kind of just either thumb their nose to this or they're not interested in this or, you know, I'm like, dude, this is game changing technology. And then they're like, well, I want to be on these old equipment and I started telling you back in the day and I'm like, well, you know, if you're not in like leather boots, like wooden skis, you're stuck somewhere in evolution. So I don't think we should be resistant on, uh, to the, to progress. And, um, with this round, I can definitely say that telemarketing has come full circle, returning to its roots and it's a viable backcountry tool where, you know, if you want to, um, slay i mean it's not it's not you're not ski gonna ski mo in this but you know the point of telling is for me like enjoying my turn on the way down so i'm not i'm not a marathon runner just trying to do something in the winter i'm a skier who loves skiing pow and this is my tool for accessing it um and yeah so i wanted to say that and then hopefully this video came out um well because this is like my third attempt. Um, I keep trying to set the shot up and sometimes like I got one, it was just dumping blower pow. And I was like, this is going to look so cool. And it was just like <sighs> wind destroyed it, you know, like the content was good, but the, the, so I went and I bought this wireless microphone. And, um, then the second time I tried to set up the wireless microphone, but I didn't uh, set the GoPro settings. Right. So I wasn't using the new microphone. And so this time I toured up, um, you know, back, uh, I'm up, uh, somewhere near birth and pass, um, about three miles deep. And, uh, I was like, let's sit down, let's make a video. Um, hopefully you guys enjoyed it and, uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, oh, and one more thing to Scarpa, I think it'd be really cool if he 
guys made um, kind of like a T2 or an F1 or something a little lighter than a TX Pro um, for people who want to just do it. Maybe like a more breathable uh, minor. I was watching, um, I like watching Cody Townsend. I like, I like watching YouTube videos. And Cody Townsend was talking about how he really, Solomon makes this like breathable, you know, liner for touring and how he insists in it. And that, that's actually kind of been a problem for me is like my feet sweat and then I, they get wet. And then at the end of the day, it's like, they usually don't get cold, but I feel like I'm like going to get trench foot or something. And you pull your, your foot out and it's just steaming. And, um, it would be nice to see, I think now that we have this, it would be nice to see Scarpa, um, you know, collaborate with some athletes to uh, design a boot that is going to be, you know, just a little bit more towards the uphill. Like, I don't want to necessarily, I've been saying alien, but I don't necessarily want to see an alien. Like, I don't want to be like Ski Motelli. Um, but just something a little better. Like, you know, it's cool that I broke that wire because I got to take these boots out, which I they had those other boots last year and I haven't been riding these. And um, they're actually probably a little better for the backcountry, but um, if they can improve the walk mode, you know, but kept them really soft, like, but it gave me just a little more range of motion and walk mode. There's a bunch of things that we can do that I think would be like, you'd see that become like the new cool boot. Um, yeah, so just to close it up, thank you for watching if you made it this far. Enjoy your turns. Enjoy your turn. Enjoy telly, spread telly. Um, you know, be nice to each other. And buddy up in the backcountry because um, I don't know what it is, but compared to kayaking, like backcountry skiers are not always that friendly. And um, it's power in numbers, man. Safety in numbers. I was talking to a friend of CA, AAC guy, uh, ice climbing the other day, and he was talking about the two camps, the AIRE, ARE, and then the Silverton um, Avalanche School. And they're kind of teaching classes in Colorado and different philosophies. And um, I think the way we should ski um, terrain. Because I don't think you're just going to take a pit and like, you're like okay, uh, it's safe. I think you should treat it like running rapids. If you're, you know, I come from, uh, you know, like more of an extreme kayaking background, or that's one of the things I've done. And the way we do that is we put one person in danger at, at a time, and then we set safety for each other. I don't see a lot of backcountry skiers doing that. You know, it's like if you if you put one person in the fall line, then it, you know if there is an avalanche, and, and you shouldn't, if you think there's going to be an avalanche, you shouldn't be there. But, you know, if you're in that, like, not sure stage, then think of it like a rapid, you know, that could any moment just break loose. And then you want only one person in that danger zone. So then you have five rescuers or as many rescuers as possible. Um, I think that philosophy is a lot better. And just also on dangerous days to stay for the streets. It's awesome. So, yeah, finally, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, I love telemarketing. I love Doug. I love skiing. I love, uh, I love Colorado. So... Enjoy.